Father President, I have the honor of presenting for the honorary degree of Doctor of Fine Arts to John D. Ratzenberger. John D. Ratzenberger, in a respected and entertainment career that has spanned more than 30 years, you have portrayed unforgettable characters populating classic television programs, iconic films, and groundbreaking animated movies. Perhaps best remembered for your portrayal of the salt of the earth mailman, you have been an ardent champion of American industry and ingenuity, employing your background in acting, producing, and writing you introduced us to the amazing work of entrepreneurs, inventors, and manufacturers throughout this nation whose products have contributed to its greatness. And true to your entrepreneurial nature, you invented a biodegradable and safe paper alternative to plastic packaging products. Your passion to inspire the next generation of engineers, artists, carpenters, and craftsmen found expression in the unique foundation you formed to promote this mission. It is also reflected in your new campaign to help rebuild America's skilled workforce through expanded opportunities for career, technical, and vocational training. Also close to your heart is the cause of juvenile diabetes. You helped create the world's largest online source of diabetes information and research, and as National Walk Chairman for the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, you helped raise more than $100 million to fund research for a cure. For these reasons, Father Chairman and Father President, the Corporation of Providence College presents John D. Ratzenberger as one deemed worthy to receive the honorary degree of Doctor of Fine Arts and request you to confer upon him this degree together with all of its rights and privileges. The impact of 21st century technology has made an enormous difference in how we perceive the sights and sounds of animated films. As cutting edge computer technology advances the sound industry, animated films likewise have been enhanced, encouraging the viewer or listener to enjoy a unique audiovisual experience. As a leading voice in the most successful animated movies in film history, John Ratzenberger has been at the epicenter of all these technological advances. From his improv days heading up a touring troupe in Europe in the 70s, to his role as the know-it-all mail, mail carrier Cliffy Clavin in the Emmy-nominated sitcom Cheers, to his current voice work in all of Pixar's feature films, John clearly has demonstrated his versatility in the performing arts industry. While John's work for Pixar is grounded in the state-of-the-art technology, simultaneously he has pursued his passion for encouraging hands-on creativity in children. As such, the Nuts and Bolts Foundation he established provides opportunities for children to be inquisitive, to be open to inspiration, and to prepare for jobs that require a mastering of basic manual skills. We are proud of John's many contributions, and we are pleased that he is here with us today, both as the proud parent of a class of 2000 graduate, Nina, and as our principal speaker. Please join me in welcoming Mr. John Ratzenberger. John. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh, the best definition of the road to success that I've heard was Winston Churchill. He said that success is a result of going from failure to failure with enthusiasm. He's also the man who said, uh, never stand when you can sit, never sit when you can lie down. So go figure. 
When I was a young man growing up in the bucolic seaside village of Bridgeport, Connecticut, it's, it's great to have you here. Have you searched them for weapons? Yeah. Much of my winter indoor time was spent reading books. Now books then were made of paper and didn't require batteries or a wall socket. The words were just right there like they were waiting for you. My first favorite author was James Fenimore Cooper, uh, the writer of The Deerslayer, Hawkeye, and Last of the Mohegans. The protagonist was Natty Bumpo. That's the part played by Daniel Day-Lewis in The Last of the Mohegans. Because of his woodland prowess and survival skills, the locals, Chignachgook especially, gave him the names of Deerslayer and Hawkeye. But the town folk knew him as Nathaniel Bumpo, Natty for short, and in retrospect, I suppose I fashioned my life using him as a template. What fascinated me most about that character is that he would set off into the deep green forests without any idea of a destination. He seemed more excited and interested in the journey through the wilderness than the actual getting there, wherever that was. No cell phone, no debit card, just gunpowder shot and hardtack enough to last until he could find something to eat. But he did have a moral compass. He knew the difference between right and wrong. He listened closely to the natives that had been in this great wilderness for centuries and learned from them the ways of survival. They in turn respected him for his willingness to listen and understand the meaning of a cracked twig or a forest gone suddenly silent. Every day was an education and he was an eager and willing student. So after my four years of university with a degree in English, I set off with some tools and traveled New England trading the skills I had picked up working summers as a deckhand on an oyster boat and as a carpenter building houses in the southern Connecticut area. Well, I thought I was a carpenter until I walked up to a building site a few years before and asked the boss if he needed another house framer. He looked down at this 18-year-old kid and said with a thick brogue, so you think you're a carpenter, do you? Eh, sure, I said. Well, we'll see, he said. And he pointed to a huge pile of joists, two by 12 inches, 12 feet long, each and every one. Move those beams over there, he said, pointing to a spot about 200 feet away across a snow and ice-covered field. I needed the work, so I moved them. It took me five days, but I moved each and every single one of them. Monday morning, the boss scratched his chin and said, you know, I think they were better over there. <laughs> so I moved them back. Like I said, I needed the job. Five days later, I was standing taller and stronger than I had ever been before, and the boss handed me a framing hammer, and he says, all right, carpenter, show me. Up until that moment, I thought I knew how to hold a hammer, but uh, apparently I didn't. He showed me where to place my thumb and how to swing the hammer efficiently and, and drive in a nail with only three blows. I've been grateful ever since. The first job he set me into doing was nailing plywood flooring to the very same two by 12s I'd become so friendly with the first weeks of the job. All summer long, I pounded nails, climbed scaffolding, and did the fetch and carry demanded by the gruff crew who didn't take kindly to this new kid on the job. A few weeks later, on a fairly windy day, I was given the job to stand on the roof joist four stories up and lift four by eight foot sheets of plywood passed from man to man up the scaffolding from the ground below. Now, I don't know how many of you have balanced yourselves standing spread-legged on narrow beams holding a succession of what became a wooden sail whenever the wind blew. It's scary. And you learn very quickly to angle the edge of the plywood into the wind, otherwise you become Mary Poppins with a tool belt. I only tell you this because that day became one of the greatest in my life. When I was holding the last sheet of plywood, I looked down to where I had been handing them to the guy in the room below. He wasn't there. 
I couldn't drop the plywood, fearing it would cause havoc and mayhem on the street below. I was in a pickle for sure. Then I heard the sounds of rapid hammering and laughter as two of the carpenters nailed the edges of my boots to the rafters I was standing on. Just to be clear, I was wearing the boots at the time. Then they doubled and triple knotted my laces as I struggled to keep my balance and hold onto the plywood that was hinting at becoming a kite. So after nailing me into the rafters, the crew left for lunch laughing hysterically. It took me a while to maneuver the large sheet of plywood to a place where I could tack it flat with a couple of nails. Then I cut off my laces and lowered myself to the floor below because they had also taken the ladder I used to climb up there. It took a long time to pry my boots loose and find some twine to replace the laces enough to wear them again. When the crew, well, when they returned, they gave me a lunch that they had bought for me and sat around joking as I ate. I realized then that I had been accepted as one of them. I knew instinctively that it had been necessary for them to test my mettle, to put me through ugly back-breaking mud-crusted tacks to see what I was made of. On that day, the lunch they gave me and the laughter that came with it was as special and grand as any Oscar or Emmy I could hope to place on my mantle. From there, I journeyed north and spent time in Bearsville, New York, right smack in the same region that Natty Bumpo explored the adventures given him by Cooper. Instead of stalking deer and listening for the slap of beaver's tail, I was using my skills helping to build a mime studio in exchange for room, board, and mime lessons. As far as I know, I became the only carpenter that could ring an imaginary bell and walk an invisible dog. But then I thought like Natty Bumpo, Learn as much as you can about as much as you can. There is no such thing as useless knowledge. Ask Sherlock Holmes, or Cliff Clavin for that matter. They understood that. While in Bearsville, word came around of jobs being offered at some music festival about 60 miles away. So a friend and I went down and I was given the keys to a large tractor after telling the hiring man that, well, I knew how to drive one. I lied, but like I said before, I needed the job. Mime is good, but cash is better. After almost flipping the thing over backwards a couple of times, I got the hang of it and became a tractor driver at the Woodstock Festival. I helped build the stage, and once it started raining, I spent most of my time pulling cars out of the rain-soaked fields of Maxie Asger's farm. I would like at this time to say that I am sorry for helping to ruin the world and apologize on behalf of the Woodstock generation. <laughs> I could have stopped it. I could have pulled the wires, I could have sent people in the wrong direction, but I didn't. And the Woodstock generation and their philosophy is what runs our culture today. Movies, television, music, and literature glorified the long-haired, drug-fueled madness. But I was there, and this is what really happened. Once the rain started, everything fell apart. No food, not enough medical care or equipment. No sanitation, no clean water. A half a million helpless flower children very close to panic. Then all of a sudden we looked to the sky and heard the thump thump of a National Guard helicopter cresting the horizon, loaded with the much needed supplies and equipment, one right after the other. If not for that, the flaunted Woodstock Festival would have possibly turned into the next Donner Party. The Woodstock Festival and its influence on our culture was saved by the National Guard. A few years ago, Senator Clinton suggested that there be a statue erected on the farm to commemorate the summer of love and its impact on a generation. My suggestion at the time was that the statue should be of a National Guardsman feeding a crying hippie. I was there. That's what happened. And I was one of them. I had a beard, a long hair. It was sickening. <clears throat> Even then, when I heard the, the uh, lyrics of the popular Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, you know, picture yourself in a boat down the river with tangerine trees and marmalade skies. You know the song. 
My question always was, who built the boat? Someone who was not stoned or drunk had to get up in the morning, measure, cut, bend, and shape wood into a boat before the Beatles or anyone else could slap on a goofy smile and imagine magic dragons and marshmallow seas. Someone had to get up in the morning, put their hand to something useful, and be responsible for their work, themselves, and their families. It was that philosophy that built and shaped this civilization. It is that philosophy that brought us to the dance, and as the saying goes, dance with the one who brought you. I have always been a fan of the Judeo-Christian ethic that you don't have to be Jewish or Christian to follow. Be responsible for yourself and the family you create, and let your work speak for you. While I was touring this great country during my show, John Ratzenberg has Made in America, I had the opportunity to visit factories that make everything from bagpipes to baseball caps to bulldozers and bathtubs. It was at one of the larger companies I got to talking with the CEO about the young workforce entering the marketplace. He told me a story that I've heard variations of across the country. He had hired a young man fresh out of college to work at the headquarter office at a very decent salary. After three days, the CEO told me they had to fire the kid. Apparently, he wouldn't listen to anyone else's advice or direction. He always thought his ideas were the best and he refused to work in a team atmosphere. The boss had no other choice but to show him the door after only three days on the job. On the fourth day, the kid returned with his mother. The mother walked up to the CEO and told him to apologize to her son because he had hurt his self-esteem. Another true story. Once again, I have to apologize on behalf of the Woodstock generation, where the notion of anointing someone with self-worth for doing nothing first raised its ugly head. Before that feel-good generation took charge, you actually had to earn self-esteem. You had to go out in the woods and figure things out for yourself. You had to listen to people who had been doing the job long before you got there. Before the notion of giving a child rewards for doing nothing, you had to be at least passively good at what you did in order to participate. Before the era of overpraise and play dates, there was a time you had to try out for a little league, and if you weren't any good at it, you simply were told so and you didn't make the team. You didn't get a uniform and a trophy simply for just showing up. But what you did get was a golden opportunity that gifted you for the rest of your life. You were able, at a young age, to learn the skills necessary to handle an emotional crisis. If you didn't make the team, you either practiced until you could, or you found something else like stamp collecting, tap dancing, or ventriloquism. Nobody gave you a trophy just for showing up, and yes, I still enjoy tap dancing. <laughs> so, I, I didn't bring my shoes with me, so you're lucky. So all you parents out there, I ask you not to scold your child's boss on self-esteem. Instead, nail the kid to the rafters and let them figure it out on their own. And my advice to you graduates is learn how to cook, build something with your own hands, know how to change a car tire, learn to whistle, make a baby laugh. Oh, sorry, that's make a baby laugh. <laughs> Do doesn't have to be yours. And most importantly, if you're ever given the honor of speaking at the commencement of a prestigious place of learning, no one to stop. Thank you. God bless you all and have a great life.